My Date with a NASCAR Driver, published March 7th, 2023. Note, I feel a subtitle to this piece should include the many facets to the Pakistani Southern Belle, especially if you read my blog regularly and think you have me figured out. Being the only South Asian in the room is something I am very familiar with. Sometimes I don't even notice the fact. But recently, I was at a bar with friends to watch the Philadelphia Eagles and the Kansas City Chiefs face off in the Super Bowl. And at one point, I surveyed the room, and sure enough, I was the only Daisy in the very heavy Phillies fan crowd. It's not a bad thing, necessarily, but it is something I have learned to cope with and adapt to. And just accept as it is what it is. Actually, I even relish in it, my ego allowing the exoticness of being the only one to feel special. This was much of my experience in every classroom I sat in from preschool to high school, even college, but mostly mixed with thoughts of insecurities, where the feeling of everyone is staring at me wasn't always felt with kind eyes. I was reminded of this a couple of years ago when my friend, who happens to be Chinese-American, and I visited the Santa Barbara wine country. After a day of tasting, we dined at a lovely restaurant in Los Olivos, and at one point, again surveying the room, I noticed we were the only folks of color in the dining room. It wasn't a big deal to me until I noticed the repeated glares not stares, from an elderly gentleman fixated on us as I devoured my deliciously pricey sausage and truffle pizza. Perhaps he had never seen two Asian beauties dine over glasses of wine and was soaking in the appreciation of his newfound sight. Or, perhaps, he didn't want to see these two others dining in his world. I can never be positive either way, but I will say this. Staring, in general, is rude. Move along, buddy. Nothing to see here. At my current job as a college professor in one of the most diverse community colleges in the state of California, I am the only South Asian full-time faculty member in a somewhat large English ESL department, which isn't too shocking, actually, and we are a pretty diverse department with other races and ethnicities representing the faculty, including my lovely Chinese-American friend previously mentioned. And as far as the rest of the college goes, there are other South Asian professors on campus, yet I appear to be the only Pakistani. If not, then it's a pretty small number. Suffice it to say, I know what it feels like to be a fish out of water, even if the insecurities have dwindled. When white people feel alone or uncomfortable being the only white person in a room with diversity, I don't feel bad for them. I just roll my eyes and think, welcome to my world. In 2004, when I was 28, still figuring out who I was, I found myself at a NASCAR event, and I quickly realized that anyone can be a fan of the sport. At the time, I did not fit the mold of what a NASCAR fan looked like, and my presence at this event clearly proved that. I probably still don't fit the mold, but it only takes one to prove something against the popular notion, and my former love, yes, former, of the sport prove that. NASCAR doesn't just belong to the good old white boys from the South. This packy gal could love it too. At the start of this new sport infatuation of mine, my father had just passed away and I was living here in Los Angeles. And though I was able to visit him before he died, I returned to my shared Encino house with my roommates shortly after the funeral and tried to resume life as usual. The usual at that time, when I was 24, was working as a studio tour guide at Universal Studios while pursuing an acting career. It was while working at Universal, hanging out in the break room between tours, where I first learned about Dale Earnhardt Jr. The last name sounded familiar to me, but I really didn't know much about him or the sport in general. Side note. I do this. I get overly interested in something, in this case a sport, and then exhaust all I can out of it before the interest subsides and I move on to something else. Other past sport infatuations of mine included the NBA and tennis. 
I went through an obsessive NBA stage when Michael Jordan was playing for the Chicago Bulls. I refused to leave my room during a game, let alone the playoffs, never wanting to watch with other people because they made too much noise. Likewise, I immersed myself into tennis during the years of Andre Agassi, Pete Sampras, and Stefan Edberg. I even had a poster on my bedroom wall of Edberg winning the U.S. Open in 1991, which accompanied my poster of Michael Jordan playing with the original Dream Team for the 1992 Barcelona Olympic Games. I mean, there may be a theme here with me, the infatuation focused more on the good-looking male athletes. But from 2002 to 2005, I was in my NASCAR phase. Before this phase, when it came to NASCAR, my experience mainly involved being annoyed at how the races always interrupted my Saturday morning cartoons when I was a kid. I never understood the point of driving around in circles over 80 times in a row. And though I grew up in the South where NASCAR fans are in abundance, the driving around in circles seemed mindless, kind of dumb, and just plain boring to me. It never piqued my Pakistani house's interest or any other Daisy or person of color I knew. Again, we, I, didn't fit the mold of what a NASCAR fan looked like. But back to the Universal Studio Tours break room where it all began. I had a co-worker, a fellow tour guide who was a huge fan of the sport. And on Saturdays or Sundays in the break room, if he was working, the television would almost always be on whatever NASCAR race was happening that day. He was high on the scheduling seniority list, so watching The Princess Bride or Swingers instead would have to wait for us non-NASCAR fans. And on a particular Sunday in February in 2001, less than a year after my dad's death, the Daytona 500 graced many TV screens across America that day, especially in the South, I'm sure, and in our Universal Studios break room as well. Tragically, the race ended the life of Dale Earnhardt Sr., who was involved in a horrible crash that took his life. I remember the devastation of my co-worker. Again, a huge NASCAR fan. It was one of those famous deaths that if you didn't know the person or the field in which they were famous for, you still understood the magnitude of their death. And the senior Earnhardt's death surely shook a lot of people. It became a sad day in that break room, even if not all of us were fans of the sport. It was a tragic loss. Earnhardt Sr. was only 49. He left three children behind. My dad was only 58 when he died the year before, leaving three children behind as well. And it was the children, in particular Dale Sr.'s son, Dale Jr., who stuck in my mind the most. His son Dale was only two years older than I was. He was also a race car driver like his father, racing in the same race that took his dad's life. And, if I'm being totally honest, my 24-year-old self also thought Dale Jr. was hot. That running theme again. But good looks aside, when you suddenly lose someone important in your life, like a parent, like I did when I lost my dad unexpectedly, well, you need to find comfort wherever you can find it. And for me, that was in NASCAR and its most famous driver at the time, Dale Jr., I can't really describe it, but I will do my best. Even today, when I tell people I used to follow the sport, I see and hear the surprise from them and even get told the occasional, usually from my more fellow liberal friends, ugh, I hate NASCAR. But for me, I was drawn to Dale Jr., even beyond his good looks and North Carolina Southern drawl. Between us being close in age and losing a father around the same time, there was just something about him. And something about the sport I found comforting. I should also preface that this new obsession with the sport developed further when I moved back home to Monroe in early 2002. The death of my dad really changed things for me in LA and I decided to move back home to recharge, to be closer to family, and to basically figure out the next steps in my life. I've written about much of that in past blogs so I won't rehash except to add that in those early months back home with my mother, I found myself one Saturday morning lounging on the couch, feeling a bit sorry for myself that I had failed at making it in Hollywood, too lazy to change the channel from a NASCAR race, 
So I laid slumped there on the couch and watched as the cars went around and around in circles over and over again. And this time, I didn't find it dumb or boring. There was something about it that just resonated with me. From that moment on until about 2005, I was obsessed with the sport. I watched every race from start to finish, knew every driver's number. I could be quizzed and in seconds spout out a number if you gave me a name. Tony Stewart, Home Depot car number 20. Jeff Gordon, DuPont car number 24. Kyle Busch, Lowe's car number 5. Before him, the number 5 car belonged to Terry Labonte. I'm rusty now and have no clue. I even did a quick Google search to see who's who in NASCAR today and hardly recognized any of the driver's names. But back in the day, I knew my names and numbers. I promise, just ask my sister Mercy. She'll confirm as she rolls her eyes. And the pit stops? Just wow. I became fascinated with how rapidly the pit crew could fuel up and change all four tires in about 10 seconds. That takes a special kind of talent and skill. Oh, and drafting? I soon learned all about the physics behind that. I was intrigued at the science of it all. And yes, I even read Dale Jr.'s memoir, memorized his stats, and visited his website daily. It's from his website in the spring of 2004 that I learned about a contest to win eight minutes with the number 81 Taco Bell Cars driver, Dale Jr. The headline for the contest read as the following. Taco salad lovers, eat your heart out to win a speed date with Dale Earnhardt Jr. By submitting the Taco Bell receipt number for the new Fiesta Taco Salad, one could possibly win an eight-minute speed date with Dale Jr. It was kismet. The Taco Salad was my favorite Taco Bell menu item, and Dale Jr. was my favorite driver. And since I was working as an assistant manager at a women's clothing boutique, New York and Company at Monroe's Pecanland Mall, during my lunch breaks, I often visited the food court and ordered the taco salad from Taco Bell. So I had lots of receipts, but I only needed one receipt to enter the contest, and that's what I did. I honestly didn't think much about the contest after submitting because who really wins those things? At least no one I knew. A few weeks later, I received a call from an unknown number on my flip-top cell phone. I didn't recognize the number, so I didn't pick it up. They called a few more times before I finally did answer, and it was Taco Bell informing me I was one of four winners who would be flown to Talladega, Alabama for an eight-minute speed date with Dale Earnhardt Jr., screaming from my bedroom, oh my God, over and over, both my mom and sister in the living room wondering what the commotion was all about. I sprinted out of my room, elated and frankly freaking out in pure Nadia fashion, talking super fast, relaying the news about eating the Fiesta taco salad from Taco Bell in the mall food court, and that I was going to Alabama to meet Dale Earnhardt Jr., the contest included a round-trip flight to Alabama, along with a four-night stay at the Winfrey Hotel in Birmingham for me and a guest of my choice. The trip also included watching the qualifying round the day before the race, followed by the eight-minute speed date, and then watching the actual race the next day. It was going to be a jam-packed weekend of NASCAR fun. Since I wasn't the only winner, as four of us were chosen, I think Taco Bell was capitalizing on the latest dating trend at the time with speed dating, coupled with one of NASCAR's fastest and most popular drivers. So at the speed dating event, Taco Bell had the four of us set up at different tables as Dale Jr. went around and spent eight minutes with each of us and our guest. I brought my good friend Lindsay with me as she certainly supported my infatuation with the sport and the driver. And a bonus only for me was that Taco Bell chose me to be interviewed on certain radio stations and newspapers across the country before the trip. To paraphrase a bit, they told me my reaction from winning was priceless and that my excitement and joyful reaction and personality on the phone when I received the news of winning sold them on the idea to choose me as the one to represent the winners, to be featured in their promotional coverage of the event. One of the articles I was interviewed for titled the piece, Louisiana Woman Hopes Dale Earnhardt Jr. Doesn't Race Through Speed Date. I remember joking during the interview that my high school's 10th year reunion was coming up and I 
didn't have a date and that Dale Jr. didn't have a race schedule the night of my reunion. And before you know it, the interviewer was asking if I'd like Dale Jr. to be my high school reunion date. By the way, this was before social media is what it is today. And though I love sharing the story to people, I'm actually glad there is little record of this online, as I think I may have come off as a bit ditzy and goofy, but whatever. I actually won something, and I needed a win at that time. But here's what really sticks out for me about that NASCAR dating experience with Dale Jr. I was super nervous and naively thought I had a chance with this guy. We chatted, more like me mumbling, about New Orleans and Mardi Gras when he learned I was from Louisiana. My girlfriend, Lindsay, smiling ear to ear for me as she was both happy and in awe of meeting Dale Jr. as well. Toward the end of the eight minutes, I slipped him a letter which expressed my admiration for him, sharing how I, too, lost my dad and that watching him race provided me comfort and solace. At the end of the letter, I included my phone number. Yes, I did that. No, he never called. To add further embarrassment, I realized later his girlfriend that I never knew of was in the audience along with the rest of the press who captured the whole eight minutes times four with each of us winners. The featured photo of this post is the picture each winner, in this case me, took alone with Dale Jr. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any digital copies of the photo, so I had to snap a picture of the print copy with my own iPhone before publishing this piece, thus the rusty look of it. I was also the fourth and last table, so I had plenty of time to remain nervous and feel completely awkward. Some of that awkwardness having much to do with the fact that I was the only person of color in the whole room. I felt like everyone was staring or glaring at me and thinking, why is this little brown girl here? Afterwards, a reporter asked me what I slipped Dale Jr. as she saw the note I gave him. I played it off like it was nothing, feeling pretty dumb about the whole thing. I should also disclose that before winning this trip, I had pre-booked a trip to Los Angeles to visit friends, something I did for every year that I was away from California until finally moving back in 2006. The LA trip overlapped with the contest, conflicting with the race the following day. Again, who wins these things? I ended up missing Dale Jr. race live at Talladega, but as the speed date with him was the main attraction of the contest, I resolved to be okay with that fact, especially after feeling like I didn't belong there. Which brings me to, I was the only person of color except for the one NASCAR employee I noticed who was black. I was 28, still figuring out who I was at the time. I hadn't even started graduate school yet, and knowing the negative stereotype of what a NASCAR fan looked like, good old boy, most likely white, with a Confederate flag plastered on the back windshield of his pickup truck, and then there was me. Daisy girl from a small Louisiana town raised by Pakistani immigrants, feeling, overall, awkward to be a fan of a sport that, perhaps, didn't belong to her. The sport has gotten more diverse today, both with its drivers and the fan base. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be the only person of color today at a race, but in 2004, I pretty much was, and I felt it, and I didn't like it. Oh, and the real reason why I was a former NASCAR fan between 2002 to 2005? In the fall of 2005, I met a boy and fell in love. We moved to LA the following year, and I never watched a NASCAR race again. I moved on. And I have figured out since then who I am. A Pakistani Southern Belle with many facets to her life who you can't always figure out.